Uh, thank you uh, for, for uh, the introduction and, and for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be, uh, uh, to be back here, uh, to have the opportunity to see some of my uh, friends and uh, former colleagues and students. Um, feels like I never left, although things uh, physically look a bit different. There's, there's been a lot of building. Um, uh, and I'm looking forward to strolling around afterwards and, and uh, enjoying the changes. But, um, but it's, a, it's really a great pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, uh, John Paul II, um, especially this year uh, uh, in which he will be uh, canonized. Um, <clears throat> it's a, a special time to remember him. Um, the title of my talk is uh, The Labor of Love. Um, John Paul II and the Sanctity of Work, and um, the, the lecture will be about 45 minutes, or 40, 45 minutes, uh, and, and I think we'll have time for questions, and if you have any uh, afterwards. I, I, I hope you do. Um, <clears throat> so, there are, uh, look for a clock here. Um, I'll just have to uh, use my biological clock, I guess. There are two texts from Gaudium et Spes um, that will forever be associated with the pontificate of John Paul II, um, both because of the, uh, the frequency with which he quoted them, um, but also because of the role they played in his uh, Christian vision of man and his task. And uh, it seems to me that these two texts from Gaudium et Spes together uh, can be said, in fact, to um, encompass the core of his, his uh, anthropological vision. The first and probably best known is from paragraph 22. Uh, you're probably all familiar with it. It's a passage that echoes words originally by one of the Pope's um, favorite, beloved theologians, Henri de Lubac. Um, in this paragraph, uh, it is stated that Jesus Christ, quote, the final Adam, by revealing the mystery of the Father and his love, fully reveals man to man himself and makes his supreme calling clear. Uh, very well known text. The second is from paragraph 24 and uh, it seems to me it provides uh, sort of a succinct statement about human nature um, in light of uh, Christian revelation that would give a, a philosophical account of the truth of the first statement that I quoted, and, and uh, this uh, text ends thus, uh, man, who is the only creature on earth which God willed for itself, cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. So these two affirmations, I think, represent in a nutshell uh, John Paul II's uh, Christian personalism. <clears throat> now, uh, there's a certain tension in that second text that uh, seems to me uh, often to get overlooked. And uh, this tension is going to be a ba basic focus of the, the brief present, uh, presentation that I'm uh, making here on John Paul II's uh, theology of work, what I'm going to call his theology of work. Um, the tension is the following. <clears throat> on the one hand, uh, this text, Gaudium Spes 24, says that man is uniquely willed for his own sake which would seem to suggest that man alone among creatures belongs to himself. While on the other hand, it says that man must, as it were, give himself away, which would seem to suggest that man precisely cannot belong to himself without distorting who he is or who he is, who he is meant to be. So which is it? Uh, if he belongs to himself, he shouldn't need to give himself away. And if he is meant to give himself away, uh, then it doesn't seem uh, to make any real sense to say that he uh, exists for his own sake, as the text says. But of course, the text affirms both, and it does so uh, within the only context that uh, can make sense of this paradox, and that is the context of, of love, and specifically the love of the Trinitarian God, whose very being is constituted by the perfect self-giving and uh, self-receiving of the divine persons. So man's being is a gift. And as St. Paul says, what you have freely been, been given, you must freely pass on. The very logic of a gift is sharing. Uh, a gift is only received properly as a gift in the spirit of gratitude and generosity. 
According to the council document, this paradox of gift characterizes not only the essence of human nature, uh, sorry, it characterizes the essence of human nature, and therefore its logic uh, must characterize all of the activities that are specific to the human being. So, if we, if we were to ask, what are the essential human activities? If we are to ask this question from the perspective of Christian revelation, our attention is drawn immediately to the well-known creation story in the opening chapters of Genesis. There we find that man was given two commandments by God, as we all know, right? The first is to be fruitful and multiply, uh, and the second is to exercise dominion over the earth. Um, and the second commandment is traditionally connected with God's placing Adam in the garden in uh, Genesis chapter 2 to, quote, cultivate and keep it. And the word for cultivate in Greek, it's agazitai, it's to, to work it. Um, so a commandment as such, a commandment by its nature, concerns activity or behavior. And the fact that these two commandments were given in the moment of man's creation <clears throat> suggests that they are inscribed in man's very being. In other words, uh, the activities intended in these commandments um, express most fundamentally who man is. So what I take all of this to imply is that the two spheres that figure most decisively in the meaning of human existence are marriage and family on the one hand, be fruitful and multiply, and, and on the other, the sphere of work. That these marriage and family and work uh, if you, uh, this reading of, the, of, of Genesis, these are the two basic things that human beings do. Okay, um, it seems to me that this inference finds clear confirmation in the fact uh, that the two most momentous decisions that we generally make in the course of our lives as we endeavor to figure out who we are and who we're meant to be are first of all a choice of a state of life, whether um, as Catholics, we wonder, you know, am I called to a religious vocation or to marriage? And if I'm called to marriage, whom am I going to marry? Um, that's the first very big decision. And the other uh, essential decision that we make is what line of work we're going to get into. What, what are we going to do with our lives? When we ask that question, what am I going to do with my life? What I mean is, what line of work am I going to get into? These, these are the two basic decisions, I think, that each of us face. And it seems to me that these, these two things, our married life and our work life, uh, in fact, end up occupying most of our uh, waking hours. Um, and if you have kids, of course, it, it occupies hours that you're meant to be sleeping, uh, <laughs> as many of us know very well. But, um, but these decisions, the, 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 the decisions we make uh, in regard to these two questions also tend to pre present then the basic context uh, that determines all the other uh, significant things that constitute our, identi our identity, where we live, um, the kinds of people that we meet, the circles that we, that we uh, spend our time in, and... Uh, activities that we do. So, so these two decisions really seem to be basic for us. Now, um, the centrality of these two spheres, it seems to me, is also affirmed in the continuation of the Genesis account of creation. The punishment for original sin, which distorts human nature to its core, but without destroying its essential meaning and uh, destiny, turns out to concern just these two spheres of human existence. So on the one hand, uh, there's a disorder in the sexual relationship between man and woman and the almost violent uh, pain of childbirth. <clears throat> I say almost violent because, uh, I mean, it's extreme, they tell me, my wife has told me. Uh, but violence is, is so something that happens contra naturum. It, it's something that happens against nature. Um, childbirth is one of the very few things, possibly the only thing, that is a perfectly natural event, but is not natural sort of phenomenologically. It's not natural. It's not experienced as a natural event. It's experienced as pain. Um, and that's, that's in itself is a, is a, is a curious fact. Um, it points to this, uh, the curse of, um, of Adam. On the other hand, there is, as we know, the introduction of burden and toil into the human experience of work. And I quote, cursed is the ground because of you. Um, in toil you shall eat its yield all the days of your life, God says to Adam. Thorns and thistles it shall bear for you, and you shall eat the grass of the field. 
by the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread, until you return to the ground from which you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So uh, the two things that were commanded to man are the two things that get cursed. Um, and that seems appropriate because we're talking about something that affects the core of human nature. Good so far? Okay. Now, uh, one, of the, one of John Paul II's greatest and most popular theological achievements is no doubt what has come to be known as the theology of the body, um, which is a deep and uh, philosophically quite sophisticated inquiry into the meaning of human sexuality in the light of creation and redemption. Though I think um, we tend to think of theology of the body as an as a, a interpretation of sex, but in fact I think the, the best way to think of it is it's an inquiry, inquiry into the meaning of the body in general, and therefore in a certain sense a meaning of the physical world, but as revealed paradigmatically in sexuality. In any event, the heart of this theology can be put rather simply. Human beings are not essentially spirits that happen to make use of a material thing called the body, but instead human beings are embodied souls, for whom the body is so fundamental it can be said, in fact, to express or make manifest who we are. Um, uh, the body is, as John Paul II says at, at a certain point, uh, the sacrament of the person. That's uh, an extraordinary image. So what does the body manifest, in fact? Uh, according to John Paul II, the sexual organs have not only a functional role, but even more fundamentally, a revelatory one. Uh, and it's, it's interesting to think that our sexual organs, instinctively, we cover them up. Uh, why? I mean, not because we think that they're going to get damaged. Uh, that's not the first. It's because we, we, we all instinctively recognize that somehow our, our, they're personal. They, they, they're intimately connected with our person. But, you know, why should those organs be that and not our elbows or our, you know, our ears. Why, you know, why? Because it, somehow the elbow doesn't reveal the meaning of the human body in the way that the sexual organs do. So it's intimate, intimately connected to our sense of who we are, our, our personhood. Um, uh, the organs reveal the essentially relational character of human existence, according to John Paul II. They reveal the fact that man and woman are made for union, and indeed for a union that is fruitful. The sexual organs are, we might say, the specifically bodily expression, signs in the flesh, that we are made to find fulfillment in giving ourselves away, to live with others in love. Um, and it seems to me, if we understand uh, that point that I made earlier, that the theology of the body is really a theology of, of the meaning of the, the, the world, the, the natural physical world in general, as it's, it's uh, as a certain paradigm, um, the theology of the body becomes a hinge for a general theology of nature and ecology. Um, and it, it, it uh, is a statement that the physical world is an, itself an expression of love. Uh, and, and if, if, that meaning is not expressed physically in the body, then it's not expressed anywhere. If it's not, if the body doesn't carry meaning, if the human body doesn't carry meaning, then not, nothing physical in the world carries any meaning at all. It's all just dead stuff. Okay. <clears throat> um, the body, as I said, is not just stuff that happens to be very close to us, uh, which we can objectify and manipulate with immunity, uh, but instead it's a physical manifestation of a vocation namely the vocation to love, and this is the meaning of human existence. So sexuality is the paradigmatic embodied locus, we might say, of the paradox of love and gift, specifically that we find ourselves, we, we fulfill our meaning, personal meaning in making a sincere gift of ourselves to others. All right, that's the theology of the body in a nutshell. Um, but uh, as I just observed, um, this theology of the body, which has had a powerful uh, popular impact, uh, not only on Catholics, but non-Catholics too, um, will remain a permanent part of John Paul II's legacy. But there is another dimension of his thought and teaching that uh, some people predict will turn out in the long run to have been a greater contribution, namely his theology of work. <clears throat> I wish uh, to propose that the bold claims um, that the former pope made about work 
and the interpretation of work that he offered in relation to the meaning of human existence um, in the context of the great social questions of the modern world. Um, and this happens above all in his encyclical Laborum Exercens, which will be my focus here. Um, but it's also uh, a theme in other encyclicals and countless homilies and addresses. Um, he, he spoke quite often about work, as a matter of fact. What I would like to suggest is the theology of work can, in fact, best be understood in light of the theology of the body. That's sort of my thesis here. Um, uh, uh, more specifically, that the, that the theology of work springs from the same root as the theology of the body in John Paul II. <clears throat> now, as far as I know, uh, John Paul II does not himself make this connection explicit anywhere uh, in his own discussion of the meaning of work. But it seems to me that uh, when you see the connection, when you, when, you, when you interpret things in that way, then otherwise disparate aspects of his uh, view of work come together in a unity and they reveal um, a depth dimension to his understanding uh, that casts a particularly um, Voitilian, Voitilian light <laughs> over the whole. In the remainder of this lecture, then, I'll try to sketch out the central features of his theology of work or the ones that I'm specifically going to connect with the theology of the body. Um, but I'm not claiming here to present a full exposition, a thorough exposition of his uh, notion of work. Uh, what I want to do is try to point to this depth dimension, this luminous depth dimension that, that connects it with the theology of the body. And I hope uh, to point out along the way what new insights this gives us uh, into the meaning of work, insights that are relevant to everybody, to every human being insofar as we all have to work and we all do. Uh, my son doesn't believe it yet. but. <clears throat> Okay, John Paul II begins uh, the third encyclical of his pontificate, Laborum Exercens, uh, the English title is On Human Work, with the claim that work is one of the most essential of the specifically human activities. Quote, <clears throat> only man is capable of work, and only man works, at the same time by work occupying his existence on earth. Thus work bears a particular mark of man and of humanity, the mark of a person operating within a community of persons. And this mark decides its interior characteristics. In a sense, it constitutes its very nature. That's from the preface of the encyclical. <clears throat> the Pope goes on to explain in part one of the encyclical the way in which work is, quote, the key to the social question. All of the big problems of um, social order come, come to a head in the question of the meaning of work. And because that's the case, the interpretation of work lies at the very center of uh, the church's social teaching. In part two, he explores the relationship between man and work, beginning, just as he did in the Wednesday Catechesis on the Theology of the Body, beginning with a reading of Genesis. Uh, he then discusses the priority of labor over capital as essential to a genuinely human and humane economic system in part three. Part four as a more detailed exposition of the principles of human rights in the arena of work. And the final part of the encyclical is devoted to a specifically theological interpretation of human work as, in one respect, a participation in God's act of creation, and in another respect, a privileged share, way of sharing in Christ's work of redemption. And that's how then the, the encyclical in, uh, concludes. <clears throat> now, uh, the specifically theological light uh, that John Paul II casts on work in this final part is probably the most significant contribution he makes in relation to more typical interpretations uh, of the meaning of work. But before looking at this in detail, I want to prepare for it uh, by first reflecting for a moment on what strikes me as his boldest innovation uh, with respect to the philosophy of work in history. <clears throat> and we are going to see that it's ultimately the theological light that he casts in the end that justifies this very bold uh, uh, interpretation that he offers. <clears throat> now, in the classical understanding, which is most clearly represented in the thought of Aristotle, uh, there's a ba basic distinction that is made in human action between doing on the one hand and making on the other. 
in doing, that was my left hand, right? In doing, uh, praxis, the end of the action is imminent, Aristotle says, to the action itself. <clears throat> Which is simply to say that the action in itself can be represented as an intrinsic good. It's, uh, uh, in this sense, going for a walk. Um, the leisurely walk I said I was going to try to do after the lecture. That would be an example of a doing, not a making. Why is it not a making? Nothing's produced. It's a doing. That means that the act itself is good in itself. It's simply good to go for a walk. In making, on the other hand, poesis is the Greek, um, the end lies outside of the action, which means that the action itself is not an intrinsic, but rather a, an instrumental good. The purpose of building a house is not for the fun of building it. The purpose of building a house is that there be a house at the end. So you can go for a walk, you can go for a stroll without needing to get anywhere, and that's fine. But um, there's no point in going through the activity of building a house unless you intend to make one. It's justified by what comes out of the action. Uh, the end of making is the product. And that's, um, uh, many of you might be familiar with uh, G.K. Chesterton's famous line, um, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. And why is that anything worth doing? He couldn't, have, he couldn't say anything worth making is worth making poorly. If it's worth making, you want to make something good. But if it's worth doing, uh, it doesn't matter how well it's done. I could go for a walk and, and not walk very fast. Uh, but it doesn't matter. It's just the action itself. So anything worth doing is worth doing badly, worth doing poorly. OK. Now work is obviously a kind of making. In work, we seek to accomplish something to increase or improve what was there, what was given to us before the start of our activity, uh, to affect some sort of transformation of the natural reality with which we started. Um, work in this sense is an essentially transitive activity. There's a communication of energy from me to the thing that I'm making. Me, house builder, it's communicated to the house and it ends there. Um, now it's for this reason that the Greeks that the ancient Greeks had a certain ambivalence towards work. There's a kind of shadow in the classical world that hangs over work. And this shadow arguably has stayed with us for as long as the uh, classical cultural heritage has remained. The Greeks thought of work as something that could never ultimately be altogether free of a certain slavish character. We make a distinction between the liberal arts, for instance, in the classical tradition, Liberal arts is things that are studied for their own sake, like philosophy, right? What's the opposite of liberal arts? Engineering. Engineering would be classified as a servile art, right? Servile. That, that, that word doesn't inspire us the same way the word liberal does, right? It sounds bad. Servile. It sounds there's a certain slavish character. This, this, that ambiguity is true of the Greeks thinking about work in general. If work is essentially instrumental activity, a means to produce an external end, then a human being who's defined by that activity, by that sort of activity, that is a human being who is an es essentially a worker, would seem himself to be an instrument rather than a person who exists for his own sake. In work, a person subordinates himself in a certain respect to a mere thing. An object. So you think about the house builder. In a way, he's spending himself. He's using himself. He's making himself a tool to produce a thing, a house. Um, he's expending his energies in its service. The external quality of the object uh, uh, of the object made means that this activity can be laborious and difficult. And a nobleman, according to the Greeks, doesn't sweat. If Aristotle famously defines a gentleman, I don't know if you know this line, Aristotle's definition of a gentleman is one who can play the flute, but not very well. Why? Because if you can play it very well, it means you've worked at it. It means that, that you're, you're probably a professional. Um, rather, someone who plays a flute just because it's fun to do is never going to become a master. And so it's the, a nobleman can do these things, but never he's always an amateur. Amateur, right? A lover rather than a professional, someone who's paid. Um, <clears throat> uh, now, to be sure, this does not 
uh, mean to imply that excellent musicianship, and indeed good work, well done, was something that the Greeks held in contempt. That's not the case at all. After all, there was a god of work, Hephaestus, right, who had a place among the other Olympian gods on Mount Olympus. And the Olympian gods are various, uh, they represent various forms of human perfection uh, and human ideals. So the Greeks had, a, a, had a, a, a god of work, which means that they admired work, but, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Hephaestus, he limped and he, and he was ugly, an ugly god. There was a certain ambivalence there. And one story is that when he was born, because he was ugly, uh, he was born of Hera, she cast him off the mountain. He didn't belong there. But he used various wiles and got back onto the mountain. He's the only banished god that ever made it back. So, but you see, that story expresses a perfectly the Greek ambivalence. They admired work, but, but they also were ashamed of it. Um, uh, he's both on and off the mountain. The intellectual virtue that governed human action for Aristotle, human action for Aristotle, prudence, was also a moral virtue, understood to belong in an essential way to the perfection of the human soul. But the intellectual virtue concerning work, techne, art or skill, was for Aristotle separate from the question of the quality of a soul. It concerned more directly the quality of the thing the soul produced. Only a good human being has the virtue of prudence. But for Aristotle, techne, the knowledge concerning work, could be just as easily possessed by a bad person. If you're looking for a worker, right, you want to know how skillful he is. You don't care about how good he is as a human being. But if you're looking for advice on how to live, that the way he lives matters. Uh, <clears throat> Aristotle, in the end, seemed undecided whether techne is a virtue. And in Nicomachean Ethics, in one place he lists it as a virtue, in another place he says it's not a virtue. He seems undecided. This is Hephaestus, on the mountain or off the mountain. It's, it's the Greek ambivalence. Now, there would seem to be some difficulty then uh, for the classical tradition to affirm that work is something quintessentially human. <clears throat> if we say that Judeo-Christian revelation has a different view of the matter, however, this does not mean that it simply reverses the classical tradition. That's very important. The ancient view of praxis with an end in itself, that is, activities that are intrinsically good and so worth doing simply for their own sake as higher than purely instrumental activities, that expresses a profound human truth, a truth that cannot be abandoned without dire consequences. Contemplation is higher than action. Leisure is higher than work. Intrinsic goodness is, indeed, a nobler kind of good than merely instrumental goodness. If we lose this hierarchy, as Joseph Pieper memorably argued in his book, Leisure, the Basis of Culture, we lose beauty, we lose the transcendent value of things, and we ultimately end up measuring all things, including finally also human beings, by something in extrinsic. Things are not good in, this, in themselves, but good only for what they can get us. Human beings are not valued for what they are, but for what they have, and finally, for what they can produce. So. If we want to avoid that, we need to uh, affirm intrinsic goodness is better than instrumental goodness. <clears throat> Nevertheless, revela revelation introduces a dimension that complexifies this relationship uh, between intr intrinsic and instrumental goodness. Um, and it seems to me that John Paul II's interpretation of work is a stellar example of this. So let's look at it. One of the constant refrains in Laborum Exergens is the claim that, quote, Man is the proper subject of work. Now, while the Pope goes on to give due attention to the objective aspects of work um, uh, that we're familiar with, he nevertheless focuses his discussion on what he calls the subjective dimension. What does this mean? Most immediately, the claim is simply a reminder that it is always ultimately a human being that does any particular work, no, no matter how much technology might mediate that activity. For this reason, when we think about work and what it means, uh, we can't treat it as an abstract thing that exists in itself. There's no such thing as work in itself. It's always something that workers are doing. And at the heart of any working activity, finally you come to a person. And the Pope wants to insist that we can never forget the person who's doing the work. But 
In addition to that obvious point, important but obvious point, the Pope is in fact making a much stronger claim, which it seems to me is revolutionary with respect to the classical understanding of work that I just described. Uh, this revolutionary claim stands out more clearly when we read Laborum Exigens against the backdrop of a talk that Cardinal Wojtyla had given at the Catholic University of Milan, uh, where the former Polish prof uh, philosophy professor um, had been invited to deliver uh, a lecture the year before he would be elected Pope. He, we always have to remember he was a philosophy professor. I think he's the first um, uh, infallible philosopher <laughs> in history, and, and, and soon to be, I guess, holy philosopher, uh, sainted philosopher, although not the first, Einstein, I guess, uh, maybe some others. I mean, medievals are, are they philosophers or theologians? Who knows? All right. Uh, in any event, um, uh, we should read this claim about um, man being the proper subject of work uh, in light of the lecture that he gave at Milan called The Constitution of Culture Through Human Praxis. Um, and it was addressed above all, uh, it addressed above all the nature of work. And there, in that uh, lecture, he explains that uh, he explains this subjective dimension of work quite clearly, <clears throat> and develops some of the philosophy more explicitly than he does in in the play, uh, papal encyclical, which is appropriate, of course. And the lecture of Wojtyla reflects on work not exclusively as a poesis, an instrumental activity that produces some external effect, uh, but specifically he calls it a human praxis. So this is already different. He's thinking of work not just as a making, but work itself as a kind of doing. <clears throat> uh, and to put it in his language from the lecture, the activity of work, uh, he says, is both a transitive activity, which, quote, tends beyond the subject, seeks an expression and effect in the external world, and is objectified in some product, uh, end quote. But it is also, quote, intransitive. That's going to be very key, intransitive. Work, he's suggesting that work is an intransitive activity. And the quote continues, insofar as it remains in the subject, determines the subject's imminent quality or value, and constitutes the subject's essentially human fieri uh, development. In acting, we not only perform actions, but we also become ourselves through those actions. We fulfill ourselves in them, end quote. In other words, the activity of work is not merely an instrumental good, the value of which is subordinated to the good of the product made, but it is also, the Pope is saying, an intrinsic good in itself. It is good, he's saying, to work. I mean, it sounds so simple, but it's actually very different from the way we normally think. It's good to work, uh, in some sense, regardless of what happens to come out of it, what is produced by it. Um, or I think more, more adequately, you could say, uh, what this suggests is that the service of something outside the self is itself an intrinsic good. It's intrinsically good to serve something outside of yourself. It's a fundamentally human good. Um, Aristotle would be shocked to hear that, I think. Well, uh, anyway. So, not content just to include this novel aspect, Wojtyla goes a step further and claims that this intransitive aspect, in fact, is the more important of the two dimensions. So when John Paul II then insists on the centrality of man as the subject of work in Laborum Exigens, what he is saying is that the intransitive dimension of work has priority over the transitive dimension. What we become in our working has more importance than what we produce in our working. So what this rather startling claim means concretely is uh, that when you are deciding about what sort of work it is uh, to which you're going to commit your life, or indeed uh, simply having already made that choice when you go to work each day, the most important question is not the amount of money you make or the benefit that you receive, and it's not even what you manage uh, to produce, achieve, or accomplish. Instead, without diminishing the importance of those things, um, what the Pope is saying is that the most important dimension uh, question is what sort of person this work is turning you into, you might say. <clears throat> How are you being transformed in doing this work? Now this is a disorienting question, it seems to me. It disorients uh, because it quite dramatically reverses the perspective from which we typically think about work. <clears throat> Not only personally, uh, but also, uh, as it were, publicly. 
So the problem of unemployment, for example, the, the, the social problem of unemployment, um, uh, shows itself to be a problem for uh, John Paul II, not because of the need that everybody has to provide for, uh, for himself, his family, um, but in a, in a more basic way because it de deprives a person, unemployment de deprives a person of his share in the good that work is. And therefore, uh, a share in the human dignity that work represents. That's, uh, you don't uh, dismiss um, making a living and providing for a family, but you have to re recognize that what's at stake here is human dignity that's attached to the doing of work. The point is that when we think about work, we need to think about the intrinsic goodness of what is done. And that means both the quality of the reality being accomplished, what is, what it is, what is it that we're making? Is this good? So if we want to ask how, what kind of person we become in the work that we're making, we have to do something that's worth doing that has a value in itself. So it's got uh, it's, it's to be something worth doing. But also we have to ask ourselves, is the way we go about doing it human? Is it good? Um, uh, not only in the questions of the, the moral questions in terms of who might be uh, exploited in certain uh, uh, production processes. That's a crucially important question, of course. But also, you know, is um, my, does the, my use of certain tools and doing the work, does that take away from the goodness of the action? And I mean, if you'll permit just a slight little digression here. Think about the production of a chair. You can, you can be a guy who uh, runs the, the factory that produces the chair and you press the, but the button and the things just kind of generate, right? And it just turns these things out. Or you could be uh, a person who manually puts a, crafts a single chair. Um, it seems to me that the question, when, when the Pope talks about the ma uh, man as the subject of work, and he talks about this intrinsic dimension, you see that, that dimension is, is at issue here. What kind of person do I become in just pressing this button, as opposed to the kind of person that has to be involved physically, materially, in the making of the thing and the kind of knowledge and demands that, that it requires. How does that, what, what does that make me into? Um, and these, are, these are, are, are really profound questions. Okay. Now, it seems to me that one might respond to this pr reversal of perspective, which uh, prioritizes the subjective dimension of work with an objection. And indeed, it's, a, it's an objection that carries some weight. Uh, one might ask, isn't this a, a rather self-centered view of work. Instead of thinking about the job we're supposed to do, it seems that we're being asked to think first of ourselves. Um, there was a recent article in uh, Slate magazine uh, online called In the Name of Love, uh, published in January, that, that criticized the popular mantra that you hear, the mantra, I guess. Um, do what you love, love what you do. That that's a slogan. Uh, this, uh, she was criticizing that. Uh, and the corollary to that is, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. You've probably heard that before. There's something really attractive about, about that. But this author was criticizing the, that slogan, uh, those slogans. Why? Um, she claimed that, that it actually devalues work and it dehumanizes uh, the majority of workers who have no choice in the matter. Um, this attitude, uh, she says, devalues work because it trivializes it. It, it, uh, it makes work about our own pleasure, about feeling good ourselves, uh, apparently. It's, it's, uh, work becomes about indulging our passion, you know, rather than doing something useful. Um, rather than uh, the serious and un often unpleasant task of getting things done simply because we have to, uh, because we have a family to support, because we have obligations to others. Most people don't have the option of thinking about themselves when they enter into what is called the workforce. And so insisting on this subjective dimension of work could seem to point to a kind of bourgeois self-preoccupation um, as opposed to the simple human effort to make a living that characterizes most people. Now, it seems to me this is a powerful objection. It's a strong objection. The article's worth, worth read, reading. Um, uh, and it deserves a serious response. Um, I will try to offer uh, uh, one in two steps here. The first, in reference to the encyclical itself. And then the second, uh, more basically, in going back to Gaudium et Spes 24 and the Pope's Theology of the Body.
All right. <clears throat> For the first, we need to understand the overall argument, uh, the context in which John Paul II puts man himself at the center of the question at work. Um, at what is close to the very middle of Laborum Exergens, JP2, provides the hermeneutical key to the whole encyclical. This rarely happens, where he says, this is what I'm saying. Uh, quote, at the beginning of man's work is the mystery of creation. This affirmation, already indicated as my starting point, is the guiding thread of this document. I wish they all said something. Like <laughs> and will be further development developed in the last part of these reflections. So the mystery of uh, creation is at the beginning, it's at the middle, and it's at the end. And he says this ties it all together. So that means it's probably important. Um, it's quite clearly the fundamental reference point for what he says. So what does this reference point reveal to us? The principal point that the Pope makes <clears throat> is that God's act of creation is, so to speak, the paradigm of human work. As John Paul II explains it, to say that man is created in the image of God it's to say that man's action is an image, an imaging of God's act. And so his work is an image of God's creative activity, odd extra, as they say. This means both that the shape and character of God's creative act is what most fundamentally determines the nature of human work. Uh, but it also means that man's work is a kind of participation in God's creation. Now, this is an extraordinary mystery. Uh, to say that it images God's act of creation, um, it doesn't mean simply that it looks like it. What, what he goes on to explain is that um, God creates the world in part through human beings working, so that the things that we make are, 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 are an intrinsic, intrinsic, internal participation in God's creating of the world. And that's, that's an extraordinary claim that he makes in paragraph 25. Um, to see how this view of work ha as a share in God's act of creation uh, provides an initial response to the question, the objection uh, that we raised, um, we have to reflect for a moment on the metaphysics of creation as it is traditionally conceived. And I will keep this short. <laughs> According to the classical metaphysics, God's creation of the world is not a subordination of God to something extrinsic. While it may seem that to say that God subordinates himself, if we were to say God does subordinate himself to something uh, extrinsic, that would seem to lift the world above God, and make it a, a supremely good thing that's even better than God. But in fact, according to the classical metaphysics, which I can't work out in detail here, uh, it doesn't work that way. Um, in fact, that ends up undermining the goodness of the world. Um, uh, because it makes the world uh, into something that an instrument that God is using to accomplish an extrinsic end. So according to the classical metaphysics, um, God doesn't come out of his, himself in creating the world, even though the world is something other than God. Why not? Because God creates the world out of sheer generosity and goodness. So his being just himself, namely generous love, create something other than himself. Um, God doesn't need to create, and that's precisely what gives the world its intrinsic goodness. Um, in this case, then, to affirm God's goodness uh, is the very same thing um, as to give himself away in the creation of the world. Um, so what this means is if we were to say that the work of creation is all about God, a God-centered notion of creation, that simply is to say that the work of creation is all about perfect self-giving love. So it's not self-centered in a, in a banal sense. Now, if we take God's creation to be the paradigm of work, we see how this understanding of the metaphysics of creation responds to the objection raised earlier. Do I work princip principally for myself or principally for others? The answer to that question is yes. God's act of creation shows that Goodness is generosity. To be good and to affirm our intrinsic goodness, then, is creatively to bring about something other than ourselves. Um, so if the essential point of the Pope's insistence on the priority of the intransitive dimension of work is to affirm work as an intrinsic good, and indeed a good for man himself, man the worker, the mystery of creation shows that this does not in the least exclude the transitive or the productive generative dimension, but in fact necessarily implies it, and indeed gives it a special prominence that it wouldn't have otherwise. The intrinsic goodness of work which fulfills man makes him more fully himself, trans transforms him into a full and complete human being, is in fact the good of giving himself away. 
and generosity. So if Aristotle tended to separate these two dimensions, we might say that the reason he did is that he wasn't thinking about work in light of the revelation of God as creator. And he can't be blamed for that. <laughs> so it should be clear that the reflection on metaphysics of creation has moved us already quite close to the language of the theology of the body. Returning to that theme brings what we have been saying about the meaning of work, uh, it seems to me, to a deep fulfillment. As Gaudium et Spes 24 says, with direct reference to the intrinsic generosity of God's creative act, man, the only creature God willed for his own sake, can find himself only in making a sincere gift of himself. To be willed for one's own sake is to be a creature who pursues intrinsic goods, that is, things that are intrinsically beautiful and true, truly fulfilling, but the generosity of creation reveals that the most sublime intrinsic good that we can pursue is the act of making a sincere gift of ourselves, serving others, bringing something other than ourselves into being. Work, then, is uh, the best and truest form, uh, is in the best and truest form, sorry, an intrinsic good of just this sort. In his Theology of the Body, as we saw, the Pope explains that this vocation to make a sincere gift of ourselves is inscribed in our very flesh. What is most private and personal, what belongs most intimately to me, indeed is, in a certain sense, me, points itself to what is other than me. So my body points to the other gender, and together points to the otherness of uh, uh, the child procreatively generated uh, in that communion. The fact that this vocation is not inscribed in the flesh means that this gift of self is not meant to be merely a gift of sentiment, of good wishes, of ideas, of conversation, but instead a bodily gift of self, a gift of our whole being, body and soul. While it is true that such a complete gift of self is possible only in a state of life, marriage or consecration, this gift of self is meant to be lived analogously in every aspect of our lives, if our lives are to be truly and fully human. Our work is a privileged place of this gift of self. Like marriage, it is a bodily act, uh, to quote the Pope from tw uh, paragraph 24. The whole person, body and soul, participates in work, whether it is manual or intellectual work. Even intellectual work is a bodily commitment, I was happy to see. <clears throat> um, but it's also bodily in the sense that it aims to transform the material world, to give it a more properly human shape. Um, now, we can't go into it in any depth here, but I, I, uh, I think it's worth indicating. Um, no, it isn't. We don't have enough time. But, but it, this, this, explains, this explains the priority of labor over capital. And it also explains the affirmation that the Pope makes that, um, of private ownership and common use that the, the whole point is that uh, work is, is the way, not the way that we take the world into ourselves. The movement isn't sort of sucking in, but uh, we extend ourselves out. We give ourselves out. So we, we, it's something that we own and it's offered, common use. Anyway, okay. Work, moreover, is a paradigm of generosity precisely because of the aspect of it that made it ambiguous to the ancient Greeks, namely, the fact that it sometimes is a laborious service, an expenditure of the self that gives rise to something other than the self, a good that in some sense is precisely for others and not for oneself. The expropriation of work, its toil, its burden, its personal cost can be transformed into a glorious good when we see it now, perhaps not in the first place in light of the mystery of creation, but in the mystery of Christ's uh, in light of the mystery of Christ's self-sacrifice in the Paschal uh, event of suffering and death, which we call properly the work of redemption. It is for this reason that the Pope, fully aware of the burdens and suffering that labor inevitably entails as a result of Adam's curse, nevertheless rev regularly spoke of the, quote, gospel of work. Work is good news. Huh. Uh, it ought to be understood as a sharing in love. Now, if we read John Paul II's Theology of the Body and the Gospel of Work in light of each other, we see that they're mutually enriching paradigms of this single mystery of uh, self-fulfillment in self-gift. Work brings out the four others aspect um, that belongs necessarily even to marriage properly understood. And 
marriage brings out the intrinsic goodness and fulfillment that ought to be also a part of work. And so that is the point. The theology of work that John Paul II developed offers us a significantly new way of thinking about this reality that occupies the greater part of our waking lives, a part that even in the modern world we, t we tend to concede as separate from our real lives. People say, no, this is my work, it's not my real life. I mean, think about what's implied there. Uh, why? Because work consists of uh, burdensome tasks that we undertake simply for some extrinsic benefit. Wendell Be Berry, uh, those who know me knew he would get in here somewhere. Wendell Berry is right to observe that if we think of work as simply making a living, we forget that working is itself living. Um, if we forget this, we fail to see that work is not just a means to extrinsic gain, but it's an activity that in itself ought to be good to do. And when we forget this, it fragments our lives, and not only personally, but it introduces a fundamental disorder into the economy. I mean, our, 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 the, the, the modern economy, economy is based on a forgetting of this, of this truth. <clears throat> now, in response uh, to the nihilism that this fragmentation entails, it's understandable that people would find attractive the slogan, love what you do and you'll never work a day in your lives. Um, but the problem with this sentiment, notice, is that it opposes love and work. Uh, and in subtle ways, that's going to dissolve the substance of both of them. What John Paul II proposes instead is that we think of work as a particular expression of love, a particular form of self-gift, which thereby, in all of its burden, has the capacity to fill our lives with meaning. This theology is one of the great gifts of his pontificate, and one that ought not to be eclipsed by the brilliance of his theology of the body, I think. It is a gift he gave, not only in his teaching, but in his person, to recall the image of this late pope and indeed this new saint. Uh, picture him. How do you picture him? Sitting in the chair, hunched over, frail, uh, spent. Uh, we see the image of one who has given the whole of himself, body and soul, to his work as a great act of love, and, and who has found therein an unsurpassable joy. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Uh, yes, Josh. Um, so let me uh, offer my question, then maybe a few words explaining uh, why I think it's relevant to what you've been shared. Um, if we think of politics as a particular kind of work that attends to shepherding and protecting the common good, right. I'm wondering how you think John Paul II's account of work might transform uh, the practice of politics yeah. if it were actually lived out. Mm -hmm. um, where this is coming from is that it strikes me that we live in a, an incredibly instrumental political culture. Absolutely. Uh, profoundly instrumental. Yeah. Um, and one that uh, has a really hard time uh, taking seriously the political actors. Uh, um, and also one in which Paradoxically, though we live in an ostensibly democratic society, we often feel very far away from the practices of trying to promote the common good that politics is actually supposed to be about. Right. Um, so would his account, if we think of politics as a particular kind of work, mm -hmm. how would it actually transform the, the way that politicians go about politics, but also our sense, as most of us non-politicians, how we relate to their work. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, very clear. And uh, I mean, I think it's a it's a it's a great question. I um, I don't know if you had this in mind behind your question, but it's what I sort of heard immediately is Plato's Republic. I mean, you use the word shepherding, and and that that the question that you raise is the question that begins that book. Um, and uh, the question is what um, what would motivate somebody to enter into politics. Um, and and one of the you know Thrasymachus wants it to be all about money and power and so forth, um, but Socrates shows him that that politics is a techne, so it's a kind of work, and technes are always the service of something other than themselves, and so politics, in the strictest sense, the logic of it is is caring for uh, the people, and so. Um, 
Uh, but that introduces then a dilemma because the politician, why would he do it if it's not, uh, if he doesn't get anything out of it? And it seems to me that that dilemma is something that carries over into the modern world. We think, okay, um, we, we tend to think of uh, selfishness and selflessness as these two opposed, you know, altruism and egoism as two opposed principles. And so when people claim to be serving the common good, we tend to assume that privately they're getting something out of this. This is, this is a power trip, this is money, There's, there are all sorts of secret benefits that you can't present publicly. And I think that's one of the reasons we're so cynical about politicians. Um, but what John Paul uh, II here is proposing um, breaks the back of that opposition between egoism and altruism and says that the common good that we find fulfilling or the good that we find fulfilling is a, is a good that transcends our selfish, self-centered interests. And that means that we actually are betraying our self-interests if we work only for our own selfish gain. And, and, and that, that then produces, I mean, and so what's the point then? It's precisely in serving others that one finds the deepest kind of fulfillment. And Plato himself points to this. Uh, he thinks that th those who are willing to give up meager private benefits in the end actually end up happier. Um, but in, in an atmosphere in which that is genuinely understood, believed, and experienced, um, the whole uh, tenor of politics, both in terms of this, the, the politicians themselves and also, it seems to me, um, the people who are served by politics uh, would be transformed. Yeah, I hope that made sense, but it's a good question. And there's more to it, but uh, I'll have to reflect. Uh, yes? <clears throat> so I have a question on the way we use the word vocation. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, like, growing up as a Catholic, I know there's three vocations that I can have. But then I also hear in popular culture that people say, I'm called to the vocation of teaching. Mm -hmm. I'm called to the vocation yeah. of yeah. whatever. Is that... How does that fall into mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this? Yeah, um, it's, uh, first, uh, uh, there's a, there, I think there's something very good about that, and there's also something dangerous about that. Okay, what's the very good? I, I think when people say that, there's an intimation of the very point that John Paul II is making about work, and that is that, yeah, it's a vocation. So vocation, what does that mean? It's part of our identity. But it also means uh, that it's, it's, it's part of our identity that requires us to accomplish something, to live for others, to serve somehow. You know, vocation, vocation um, um, uh, uh, is always uh, in, in, in Balthazar, uh, the theology of Hansers from Balthazar, who, who's one of my uh, favorites. Yeah. Uh, uh, to be called is always to be sent. You know, being called is to be sent. And so um, the, the, a vocation that identifies you is a work for others. And in that sense, I think that's, that's uh, true and profound. Now, um, I think it's really important to, to distinguish between the vocation of a state of life, marriage or consecration, that sort of fundamental um, uh, uh, choice that involves a vow, a taking of a vow and a permanent commitment. Um, and work, which is, is, is analogous to that, but uh, for the most part, you're not required to take a vow <laughs> when you sign up for sign a business contract, you know, that would be a little scary. Um, so so the, it, I, I don't think, uh, I think that, that you end up sort of confusing things if, if you allied the two. Um, nevertheless, to distinguish them, it's very important that you don't lose the very deep point that work should be a kind of love. I often hear the girls around me say, um, my vocation is to be a mother, so I'll deal with marriage. Like, mm -hmm. So I'll get into that. How do you, like, how would you suggest communicating the difference between a vocation as a state of being and a vocation as a marriage? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is obviously very fundamental and beautiful work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, though, the, the, the more concrete those questions become, the more they have to be sort of determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Um, uh, uh, but, I mean, as a matter of principle, it seems to me that uh, there is an order. I, I do think this, um, 
and but this is rule of thumb and not absolute rule. But there is there is something about uh, the um, figuring out the vote, the uh, state of life question is is comes before figuring out work because um, you know if you join a religious order, uh, uh, they send you to a particular work. You don't you don't tell them what you're going to do. They tell you. Um, and if you're and if you're married, that's going to so anyway. So it seems to me the order is 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 important. Yes? Um, if the first mandate in Genesis, we could call that like reproduction, mm -hmm. like one work, mm -hmm. um, and then John Paul II makes us fall in love with both of those, yeah. even though they've been cursed now, mm -hmm. um, and we see them as integral to us, mm -hmm. um, but I, well, you can't really imagine reproduction being redeemed in the eschaton in a way that there's still reproduction. Just okay. Uh, okay. But it seems like some theologians do think there would be work. Mm -hmm. So do, do in we, the eschaton. Yeah. Will we have work in the eschaton? And if so, what do you make for the women of reprodu reproduction in the eschaton? How does that continue in a sense? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, first of all, I, I, you know, I've never been there. Um, uh, so I, 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 I don't know, but, uh, just thinking in terms of, um, uh, but clearly whatever the eschaton is has to be inchoately present now or else you run into to problems. Um, and, and it, and it seems to me that, um, you know, Charles Piggy, uh, one of my favorite, uh, poets, um, talked about the cathedrals in France, they're too beautiful to be left behind. So they're clearly going to be in heaven, right? The, the cathedrals, the French cathedrals will be in heaven, he says. Um, but you can't imagine them needing repair, right? They, 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 they're, they're there. Um, th that's a, that would be a kind of a celebration of human work, their being there. But, but I don't think it would have to continue in its... Um, uh, yeah. On, on the other hand, um, can it be the case... Can, is it possible to imagine hap, total happiness that doesn't have a kind of fruitfulness? That um, that strikes me as a very sterile, I mean, literally, uh, notion of happiness. And it's hard to imagine that as, as true human fulfillment. There's something about the joy of giving birth, um, the joy of, you know, finishing a book, um, is it's... There's something that's incomparable, and it would be hard to that to imagine that not being part of final human fulfillment. Um, but what? So I'm, I guess on the one hand, I'm saying it can't be just sort of having to repair the house. On the one hand, on the other hand, it can't be completely absent. It's got to be some some transformation of both. And I would imagine something tr uh, similar would be true about you know actually actual childbirth. Um, yeah, there's got to be even even that kind of a fruitfulness. There must be, but yeah, this speculation. Thanks for your question. Yes. Uh, two -pointer, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. It sounds kind of like a, would you, would you want to say that for God doing and making there is no mm -hmm. fiction, and that if the, if that is the case, then the reason why something like procreation or work are the best or the the most integral parts of humanity is because. They sort of capture, yeah. Because for, for both of those activities, you can't distinguish between doing and making. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, yes. <laughs> Short answer. Yeah. Um, I, no, I, that, that's a that's a that's a great insight, and and it's it's interesting. I mean, that would be a way if you think of God's um, God's activity as being both a doing and a making simultaneously. Means then that the human distinction between doing and making can't be an absolute one. That each one has to share in what's perfect. Uh, uh, to be perfect in itself would have to share something of the other, um, uh, and and that would be something that would elude Aristotle. I mean, you know, in, in implicitly you can see things in classical thought. I, I don't want to draw too big a distinction between classical thought and Christian thought by any means. Um, but but it's cl uh, that something like that would be much clearer given the revelation of, a, of an absolutely transcendent God um, that, play, that Aristotle wouldn't have access to. Yeah, that, that, thank you. That's a, that's a helpful insight. Um, you said towards the end that the problem of love what you do and not work a day in your life mm -hmm. uh, is that it separates work and love. Mm -hmm. And then you offer the image 
punch code where mm -hmm. uh, would you affirm that there's a, a suffering a burden that's somehow essential to mm -hmm. work and then as a corollary to that would God suffer a burden in creating mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, you know I I, uh, I don't think um I, I think the answer to that has to be very careful and paradoxical because I don't think that you can make pain, suffering, essential to the meaning of work. And I mean, if you go back to Genesis, it's, it's uh, God doesn't start out by commanding the sweat of his brow. He starts out by, you know, placing him in the garden to tend it in presumably in perfect joy. Um, the sweat of the brow is a response to sin. So it can't have... It's, it doesn't have the same ontological status, you might say. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, one of the problems in uh, modern Enlightenment thinking, um, if you read a lot of the founders of, of, of the Enlightenment, they wanted to try to um, recuperate the original blessings of creation uh, through the technological excision of any of the curses. You, you, so you can sort of get rid of original sin, and you know, it's, it's kind of a, an ersatz redemption in, in their thinking. And I, I think you can trace all sorts of really profound cultural problems back to that effort. So what does that mean? That means that there's got to be something um, in the very uh, curse of what was essentially good that still reveals uh, something that reveals something about the goodness of creation that can't be revealed by removing it. So in a, in a kind of a paradoxical way, suffering becomes, is allowed to become a revelation of love that an attempt to get rid of suffering simply, eliminate it simply wouldn't. Um, and that, but notice, it's, not, it's different from saying that suffering is essential to love. You, uh, you would say that it's, it has become essential to love in the fallen world. And if that's the case, then um, insofar as it's an expression of love, whatever perfection we discover in suffering, and we all recognize, you see, you see someone who is spent in a, a, a gift. I mean, um, uh, you know, this comes out in so many of Lars von Trier's movies. I've, I haven't watched the last few, but I mean, those are those are always really disturbing, but kind of in a mind-blowing way. But typically, you have somebody there. I mean, have you ever seen like Dancer in the Dark? Um, that movie, uh, there's an an act of of generosity there that is just it's devastating, and 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 but it's self but it's self-sacrifice. It's it's actually destructive, and you it, but you recognize it somehow in that in that sacrifice, there's something profound that's revealed that couldn't be re revealed otherwise. Something of that has to be true of creation. That, that's that got to give you an insight into the meaning of creation, but with the qualifier that it's the way that a, a fallen world gives insight into the meaning of creation. Yes? Um, the, the question about the two principles you mentioned at the end, so priority of labor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And private ownership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, uh, right. Uh, I wonder if you think there, there's a tension between these, these two. This is sort of a capitalistic, I'm not a big capitalist, but yeah. it seems important to uh, I mean, If one could show that without um, some sort of system of capitalism, there's really not going to be all that much private ownership uh, to devote to common use, uh, then this principle becomes effectively you know, meaningless. Uh, so not enough people have enough to spare give anything away. Um, so, I mean, how, how do you speak to that, uh, that objection, which I think is, you know, very much in the pages of Adam Smith, um, that you know, we need, you know, in order to be charitable, in order to give, we need uh, a lot of what we were just saying, to uh, really transform nature, uh, really sort of empower ourselves, uh, and this requires, uh, you know, if not the absolute prioritization of capital, at least um, giving it a new Prominence, 
Yeah, I mean, um, I think I understand your question. That, that's 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 an interesting one, uh, and would, would would take some time to respond to. Let me see if I can just sort of narrow, uh, just hone in on a principle. I mean, um, it seems to me that there's a there would be a faulty pre premise in that uh, in that objection that that um, uh, that would equate private ownership with the capitalist form. Uh, I mean, um, and that's clearly not a necessary connection. There's n not a necessary connection between those. As you mentioned, um, the principles in Aristotle in his politics, and he's not a capitalist in the modern sense. Um, so, I mean, so, so that that, um, that can have a different foundation. Uh, um, uh, in, in Adam Smith and the, the thinking of the 19th century, that, that, that kind of thinking was driven uh, by um, a certain um, uh, assumption about scarcity and and the, the 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 originality of scarcity somehow, um, which I think is a, is a profoundly non-Christian assumption. Uh, in fact, um, to, to connect it with the, the 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 relationship between capital and labor, um, what John Paul II means by that, the reason that labor has priority over capital is that um, I was going to contrast him with 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 Locke um, through labor. You know his whole his whole system, which is essentially the roots in, of capitalism, is 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 property. It's sort of centered on property, and you get property by working. So work is a means to you mix something with your work, and now it's yours. It's a way of sucking it into yourself. But with this uh, theological anthropology, that the Pope is is suggesting it's exactly the opposite. By mixing something with work. Uh, my work, I'm actually making it available to others. And and the point of possessing things is for, and he says this, it's very interesting, the point of possessing things is, is, is to be able to work better. Um, not because we need to drive ourselves to death, but that, I mean, this is in a certain sense an Aristotelian insight, we're happiest when we're active. I mean, we want to be, uh, we want to be um, fruitful. As you know, when I mentioned that the fruitfulness in the ESCA, a lot of people were nodding. We recognize that as some somehow being part of our happiness. Now, if if you have that interpretation, just think about that as if that's your interpretation of the relationship between capital and labor. Um, uh, you're going to start with abundance, <laughs> because the, the 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 default is fruitfulness rather than acquisition, and uh, and so the the very premise that this need to in, uh, uh, increase ownership in order to, to have generosity um, just falls apart. That was a longer answer than I intended, but okay. Sure. John Paul II addressed the question of scarcity and its faultiness of its materials that you studied. He, you know, he talks about, um, you know, he, I, as, far, as far as I know, um, I don't recall an explicit engagement with Adam Smith or something of, of that sort. Um, but but uh, he does um, talk about the, the the fruitfulness, the original fruitfulness, and this principle of abundance. I mean, that's that's a, clearly a guiding principle in his in his thought. Um, but I, I that'd be interesting to look into further. Thanks. Yes, Mike. Hi. So when you were speaking about um, that the activity of work and um, producing something that as a gift mm -hmm. as kind of the fulfillment of human nature and then that's why like you, instead of saying you know love what you do so you don't work like you precisely love working mm -hmm. um, how do we um, it seems like one person a person could say that there's like some opposition where you could say okay yeah I'm working and giving but just because I know I'll be happy you're doing it and I don't really care about making something for someone else mm -hmm. like how do we yeah I, I think that would uh, um, that would be a more uh, fall closer to that principle that that um, that article was criticizing that uh, um, uh, love what you do do what you love in the sense of make it all about enjoying yourself without any regard for what comes of it but it but it seems to me what 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 John Paul II is arguing for loving your work is I mean he's not denying the work character of of it so so in other words, he's combining poesis and praxis. He's not saying 
forget the poesis and make it all praxis. He's not saying it's not a making, it's only a doing. He's trying to unite the two. And that means that the, the, the making dimension has to be taken very seriously. And, and I think, I mean, practically speaking, we, we find that that's the case. It's hard to get really um, involved in your work um, if you're doing it poorly. I mean, can you imagine somebody who says, I love to make chairs. I don't care how they turn out. I don't care if people can sit on them. I just love to make them. You would have to say, well, you don't love to make chairs. You love to you love to cut things with wood, maybe, but you don't. But you don't love to make chairs. If you love to make chairs, you're actually very deeply concerned with how good they are, and 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 you want other people to love them. And you know, I mean, th this changes our whole. I, I, um, if I could recommend a book to you, um, Matthew Crawford's book, uh, um, what's it called again? So, uh, Shop class as soul craft. Uh, there's some salty language in it that, you know, just to warn, warn you, PG-13, I suppose. But, but uh, it, it's really a beautiful reflection on what meaningful work can be. And what's, what's interesting about it is it's not romantic. I mean, he's talking about working in a, in a mechanics shop. So um, he's not talking about the chair maker. That's, an, that's kind of a facile example. That's the one Piggy uses, but that was in the 19th century, you know. Um, uh, but uh, but he's talking about you know fixing cars, um, but has just profound insight. But even there, so it's not just a modern context. Is he's critical? He thinks that technology now, uh, in a way, separates the worker from the work in a way that makes it impossible to really love your work anymore. Um, you you plug the machine that diagnoses now what's wrong with the car, and you know as he pointed out that the, the people who work on cars in that way don't understand they don't know what cars are they they've never really experienced a car and they don't know what's going on they just follow the instructions, and notice they're not really you can't love that work because there's not a, th a reality that you're loving it's got to have some connection with you know some real physical connection with the world for you to love it. Um, yeah, so I think that would avoid the danger that you point to. So thank you very much. Thanks.